Good morning, Lifebridge Church. How are we all doing this morning? Great to see you. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. And actually, every day is the day the Lord has made. And the Bible says, choose joy. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Again, we have a lot of uh, uncertainty going on uh, around the world. But this is one thing is certain. Jesus is on the throne. And the Bible talks about Jesus being light. Satan demons being darkness. Darkness is not overcome. Jesus says he is overcome the world. Psalm 27 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet will I be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. And I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Folks, this is why we sing. Jesus is worthy of our praise. And the Bible says, that we talked about upstairs before service, if we don't do it, the rocks and trees are going to cry out because they give praise to their creator every day. And it makes me think of the song, This Little Light of Mine. I'm going to let it shine. That's when we receive Jesus as Savior. The light of God lives in us. Hide it under a bushel. No, be strong, be bold. Go out and tell about Jesus and what he's done for you and what he can do for them. Don't let Satan it out. We're going to let it shine. Put on the full armor of God so that we can stand against the wild snares, attacks, and traps of the devil and his demons. Be bold. If you don't have the light of Jesus living in you today, today is the day for your salvation. Don't leave here without it. Amen? Let's stand and sing. Here we go, lift it up. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. What nation I'll know and he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Lift it up. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Through every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What patience we wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calming us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. They are many, His mercy is more. Lift it up, here we go. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness to every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Riches of kindness he lavished on us 
His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Lift it up, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Through every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, through every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness. Stronger than darkness, new every more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Amen. Amen. So awesome to hear you all sing. Thank you. It's so great to hear. Take the time to say hello to those around you. How good it is to see him here this morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to LifeBridge. We, uh, we welcome you, whether you're here joining us in the, uh, in the sanctuary or in any of the other rooms in church or at home joining us. We welcome you. We want to extend a special welcome to any uh, newcomers that are here. Um, if you get a chance to, please uh, go on our website and sign in and let us know that you're here. We can send you a gift. We also have water bottles in the back of the service um, for you where it gives a lot of information about our church. Um, as well as more ways for us to contact you and for you to contact us if you have questions. Um, throughout the church, we have boxes as well that you can give your offering in or your prayer requests. There's a little insert in the book, in, in your uh, bulletin that you can fill out and uh, put them in there. Um, or feel free to uh, register that information online as well. Um, and we always like when you give online because that makes things a little bit more uh, seamless and easy to move through. Um, so we just want to make you aware of that, and uh, feel free to browse our website as there's a lot of information on there. Um, I also want to let you know that in the back we have books by Max Lucado called On Calvary's Hill. I have an example of it up here, and you can see it on the screen as well. These are going to be devotionals that we're going to be uh, starting next week, um, uh, talking about um, just preparation for Easter and everything that went on with that. So there are books in the back. Um, we're going to plan to start actually reading them this week um, is March 2nd. Uh, there's a requested donation of $5, and you can arrange that in the back um, of the service. Um, coming up next week are electives. We're going to have two options where um, our normal community groups break. The first one is going to be resolving everyday conflict. And now many of you might have heard those words before and you might think, oh, yeah, we've done resolving everyday conflict. We've done peacemakers before. I'm good. But I'm guessing that we still all have conflict. So uh, getting a refresher course in it and a different view on it and take is always helpful. Um, so the goal of this is to help us learn how to resolve conflict and make peace with others in a biblical way. The second uh, class that's going to be offered is called Spiritual Habits of the Home. And the focus of that is to use your normal family rhythms and how to grow um, using that in both your personal relationship with Jesus and in discipling your family. So I don't think you can go wrong with either option. Um, so they'll both be great. Um, in your bulletin, you have a, uh, a little insert pack. Um, so please uh, grab that. You can read the descriptions and fill out which one you're interested in so we can make decisions based on how many people plan to come to which class. 
um, and then we can hand those in um, to uh, anybody in, in, the, in the back welcoming um, so we can start to get that uh, information gathered. Um, then coming up as well, we have the All Church Summer Getaway, which is always a great time. So once again, save the date, August 11th through 14th. Coming up in the next couple of weeks, we will have a uh, reservation um, and a sign-up information for that. And there will be a short time of early bird registration with a little bit of a discount. So stay tuned for uh, all that information. Um, and I'm going to invite Pastor Bob up to pray for us today as uh, we have a lot going on in our world. And uh, it's, it's good to get. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Tom and I, by the way, we're going to be doing, we will be the ones that will be uh, doing uh, resolving everyday conflicts. So we look forward. These are great. These are great electives. And even when we have... Uh, been taught certain things, we know that we need to hear these things over and over again, don't we? Well, we are going to pray. I'm going to pray for our world and for us. As we all know, our world is in conflict. That's nothing new, though, is it? But we've seen it erupt over this past week. And one of the things that was really encouraging to me, though, was to see a short video clip of both Ukraine's and also Russian believers that were worshiping together this week. And I couldn't make, quite make out all of the words, but I did hear the word gospel, 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 and I took it from what I was listening to. It is, let's go out and let's make sure people know the gospel. And times like this have a way of refining us, don't they? Of sobering us up, of re helping us to realize that Life isn't just about going in and out of our daily details, but there is a God that reigns above all, and that we need to seek him at this time. So please join with me in prayer as we pray. Father, we thank you that your word has laid out many, many prophecies of what is going to come and what has happened. As a matter of fact, we know that 60% of your word revolves around prophecy, and which means that you have told us, you do tell us, you tell us even in your word in Ezekiel 38 about the role that Russia will play in the end time. So we are not taken by surprise by anything that we see. You've told us in your word many times that you reign over all, that you are in control, and that the heart of rulers is in your hand. In Psalm 2, we read, Father, where it says that the rulers of this world take counsel together and they want to throw off the bonds, that meaning your constraints, your control. And the, the answer that you give in verse 2 is that you laugh at them because you raise them up, you bring them down. But Father, today we do pray for our world leaders um, that have a part in resolving the conflicts that are taking place. And Lord, we pray that your spirit will convict them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. We pray, Father, over the people of Ukraine. Uh, we know that there are many believers in, in Kiev and different cities in Ukraine. And Lord, we pray that in the midst of this, that you will help them, help the gospel to go forward boldly that you will open up doors of opportunity, that you'll protect those that are missionaries that are serving there. We think of Reach Global and the workers that have decided to stay there. Give them boldness that they may proclaim Jesus Christ. We pray for protection over the people. Father, we, are, we know that we live in a world that is broken. Not just broken, it's sinful. And it has turned its back on you and needs Jesus Christ. And we think of ourselves even here in the United States, Father, there is a need for a spiritual awakening to take place, and we know that that kind of awakening first starts with revival in your church. And so, Father, we pray that you bring revival to your people, that we might live as shining torches for others to see. And, God, we have hands that are, are, are dirty and need to be clean. Father, clean us up. Help us, first and foremost, in our own hearts, in our lives, be clean before you so that others might see the light of Jesus Christ around us. Lord, our own nation is standing in need of revival to take place. God, we pray that you would, one, if it's just one last time, that you would open up the hearts and the minds of people to be receptive to Jesus Christ, and there would be one more great in-sweeping of people before you come. Father, 
We look forward to the appearance of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come and come quickly. And we pray this in the name, in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Bob. Thanks, Tom. Please stand with us.
restless, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is born. Is found is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free. Only this is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Temptations come my way, and when I cannot stand up, fall on you, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. To teach my soul to rise to you, when temptations come my way. When I cannot stand up fall on you, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh, I need you. Oh, I need you. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you, oh, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one. Go, my God, my Father. My God, my Father, while I stray. Far from my home, my life's rough way. Oh, teach me from my heart to say, Thy will be done. Dark my path and set my life. Let me be still and murmur now. Or breathe the prayer divinely taught. Thy 
will be done. But let my faith in her be baptized. For most I prize it never's mine. I have a gilded what was thine. That will be done. Sweet spirit for its gifts. My God to thee and thee the rest. That will be done. Renew my will from day to day. Blend it with thine. Take away all that that makes it hard to say. I breathe no more. And when on earth I breathe no more, the prayer of mixed with tears before, I'll sing upon a happier show. I'll sing upon a happier show. will be done that will be done that will be done all God's people say Amen. amen you may be seated and I invite you to take a copy of the scriptures and go to the book of 1 John. And if you're not quite sure where 1 John is, go to the book, last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation, and back up four books, and you are in the book of 1 John. So that's an easy way to figure it. And before I get into the sermon, let me say it is good to see old faces and friends that are reuniting once again to worship our Lord. And Mike, I'm glad that you're back here because those amens, you're the cheering section, man. So Mike Mangione's with us, and I know there's others too, but it is good for God's people to get together. And there's new faces that are part of this church as well, and um, we know that God is at work, that he's doing his work throughout, throughout this world. Well, people, I don't know about you, how many of you have ever found yourselves in a, uh, 
a bad neighborhood, I mean a scary neighborhood by mistake. Raise your hands if you've ever been in something like that. It can just make your skin crawl, can it? Well, about a year ago, this time, about a year ago, last January, Gene and I uh, uh, took a road trip that took us through the wee morning hours. As a matter of fact, we drove right straight through the night. We saw the sun come up. As all was actually very well, I preached in church on a Sunday morning, then we left and we made our way down south, and all was doing very well until probably sometime around 8 p.m. or so, the pressure indicator on the dashboard, the tire pressure indicator on our dashboard started to glow, an amber glow. You all know what that means. Maybe you've seen that happen for you. But I'll tell you, this was not something I wanted to see in Louisville, Kentucky, in the city of Louisville, Kentucky, that we happened to be traversing through at that very time. And to make matters worse, it actually started to snow on us. So it was cold, it was dark. Uh, we had the tire indicator on, and immediately I thought to myself, how in the world am I going to find a gas station that has an air machine here in, Saint, uh, here in Louisville, Kentucky? Well, Jean did a quick search on uh, Gas Buddy, and she found a gas station that led to an exit in the heart of the city that led us to a Thornton's gas station in a very dark, seedy part of the city. Let me tell you, it was dark. But we needed air. At least that's what our dashboard was telling us. We needed air. And so, to my surprise, as we pulled into the Thornton's gas station, they happened to have two air pumps. Whoa! I thought, wow, I get a choice of two. Went to the first one, and the, and that, you know, the, the nipple thing where he, he puts the air into the tires, it was actually cut off the hose. Somebody had taken it. And then going over to the second pump, I put the credit card in, and it wouldn't take it. Looking around, I thought to myself, we are out of here. We headed out of Dodge really, really quick. Now, as we motored out of the city, Jean got the brilliant idea that she should call Honda Motor Corporation. It was a Honda. And to our surprise, they had the ability to read our car's computer. I don't know what else they're reading these days as you drive down the road. But they were able to read our car's computer, and they indicated to us that all was well, and they walked Jean how to reset the computer so that the pressure indicator light would no longer be on. Let me tell you, being in a strange, dark place isn't a lot of fun. Well, what's true for us physically is also true for us spiritually. Walking in spiritual darkness is worse than physical darkness any day. This leads us to this morning's passage, and if you don't have your Bibles open to 1 John, I encourage you to do it, even though I will have uh, the passage up on the screen. But I'd like you to follow closely as I read what God says to us through an aged apostle in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, beginning. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is God's holy word. Amen. Amen. Now, the immediate question I think that ought to come to everyone's mind after reading this passage is this. Who is the gray-haired apostle speaking to? in this portion of scripture. Is it Christians or is it non-Christians? Well, I'm going to give you my answer. I believe he is speaking first and foremost to followers of Jesus Christ, knowing all the while that unbelievers and also false teachers will be listening in as this letter is read in the churches that surround the area of Ephesus. His words, I just want you to know, his words are personal. Every follower of Jesus Christ 
that is listening to this message this morning should take the words of this apostle to heart. Spiritual darkness is not our friend. Sin is not our friend. We are told that we need to, that we must walk in the light as Jesus Christ himself is in the light. Sometimes in preaching, I don't tell you where I'm going until I get to the end of the sermon. Other times I tell you straight up at the beginning. So today I'm going to give you my sermon in two sentences. It is this, walk in the light or you will stumble and tumble in darkness. When you tumble, be humble, come clean and confess your sins to God. Do you like that? Pastors love things that rhyme, don't they? We love to do that. And we also love alliteration in case you didn't figure that out as well. But let me say it again. Walk in the light or you will stumble and tumble in darkness. When you tumble, be humble, come clean and confess your sins to God. Let's get into the passage. And as we do... Remember from last week, one reason that John wrote this book was so that we might experience fellowship with God and with others. And when I say fellowship, I mean deep intimacy with God and also with other, other people. Let's begin by taking a closer look at the very first sentence, walk in the light or you will stumble and tumble in darkness. And the very first thing I believe that John wants us to get, if we're not to tumble, or stumble, is this. If you want to stay out of spiritually dark places, you must know who God is and what he offers. Look again at verse 5. Now, this is a message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. Now, if you read through the scriptures, you will discover that many biblical authors describe a whole lot of what God does. They write of God's power, they write of his work, his will, and also of his ways. John here, and in the Gospel of John, and also in 1 John, is more concerned with who God is. He wants us to see the nature of God Almighty, for his will and also his ways flow from who he is. And to help us understand the essence of his nature, the apostle in this book uses three images or metaphors. The very first metaphor or image we looked at last week is this, that God is life. He is the creator and also the sustainer of all life, including yours. Today we're going to look at that God is light. We see this in verse 5. If you turn over to chapter 4, verse 8, you will read that God is love. Now, of those three there, the one that I think gets the most attention today is God is love. So much so that the phrase can actually be turned around like this, love is God. And that's not true. God is love, but love is not everything that God is. People today paint soft hues, sentimental hues or colors of the love of God. Many today talk of God's love as though it is his core attribute with all others playing supporting roles. And we will talk more of his love in the coming weeks. What I want you to see today, what I believe the apostle wants us to see today is that God is light. I want us to take a look at this, and you too may think that that light is high up on the list of most people, but once you figure out what the light of God is, you may not think so, because I don't really think it rates that high for most people. Let me read verse 5 again. God is light, and there is absolutely, if you have your Bibles open, that would be a great word to circle, absolutely no darkness in him. You see, the last half of this verse qualifies the very first half. So what does John mean? Well, here's, here, let me lay it out. He means that God is holy and pure. He is in a source of purity, but it's fountainhead. As such, because of that, there is no possibility of even a trace of evil within God. I like how Chuck Swindoll puts it. God is all light, zero darkness. God is all good with nothing bad. He is all pure with nothing impure. He is all clean with nothing dirty. He is all truth with nothing, nothing false. He is morally pure. He is the very definition of what ethics is. 
And as I've said to you many times before, holiness, I believe, is God's core attribute, and all other attributes wrap around the holiness of God. I say this because of how many times this word is mentioned in a row in Scripture. In Isaiah's vision, two angelic beings cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the whole earth. If you turn to the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the four living creatures in heaven, I believe they're crying out right now in heaven around the throne, day and night, the scriptures say, they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That last part, I really like, Jesus Christ is coming. You see, when, when, when an attribute is repeated three times in a row in scriptures, we all ought to take notice. It means sit up, take notice. This one is really, really important. It means that it's the foundational attribute for all members of the Trinity. That's why, God, Jesus, or that's why John uses the metaphor of light to describe God and his son, Jesus Christ. He is holy, therefore, because of his holiness, there's the radiance of his glory. There is the light that we can walk in. The psalmist puts it like this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Let me give you a little application. This means that God will never, ever, ever lead you astray. He will never put you in a wrong direction. When you read his commands, when you read his will, when he uh, discloses his will to you, he will never lead you astray. Walk with him and your path will be light. Walk in the light or you will stumble and tumble in darkness. Now, now the amazing thing is this. There's this invitation. God invites his children to walk in his light. Now, I had a good dad. My dad still is a good dad because he's still alive, and he was a great dad. And I I know that he gave me many instructions growing up. I know in my teenage years, I didn't want to listen to my dad so much, but one of his favorite phrases then became this. When, When I wouldn't listen, he'd say, go ahead, go ahead, try it. You'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. I said, what do you mean by that? He says, oh, I'm not going to tell you anymore. Just go ahead. You'll figure it out. Well, I know what he meant. He had had shared his light with me, and I had turned my back on it so many times. And God here in this passage invites us to walk in his light. Verse 7 says this, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Let me read that again. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And this makes perfect sense because two cannot walk together unless they actually are agreed. And by the way, the phrase there, one another, includes communion, includes community, not only with God, but also with fellow believers in a local church body. I'm going to give you some concrete examples of what this looks like a little bit later on in today's sermon. So he gives us invitation. But to help us understand the nature of this invitation and its importance, John then goes on to address three prominent lies that were floating around in his day that are still floating around today. Now, you'll notice, if you have your scriptures in front of you, that each one of these phrases begins with these three words, if we say, if we say, and all three of these are lies. Lie number one is this. We can live like the world and still be tight with God and fellow Christians. That, my dear congregation, is a lie. That is a lie. Sin is darkness, and darkness, when we walk in sin, it breaks fellowship. It doesn't take us out of the family of God, but it breaks fellowship with God, and it also harms our fellowship with fellow believers. We see this in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship, which means partnership or communion with him, we walk in darkness, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. To walk in darkness simply means this. It means to treat sin lightly in our lives. It's, it's not a big deal. I've been living with it for a long time. Who cares? The present tense in this passage indicates For us, a continual practice of that which is opposed to God 
and also his commands. So I want to assure you here that we're not talking about occasional sin, some things that we, we do. We all, we all happen to sin. But John is speaking to an habitual lifestyle of sin to the extent that if, if, uh, if one of your workers or neighbors or, or classmates heard that you are a Christian, that they, they might actually be surprised because there's either no sign of it in you or that you are living pretty much so and valuing pretty much the same things that they value. Ephesians 4.30, it's a great verse. The Apostle Paul said this, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, when I grew up as a kid, I was in a a Bible-believing church. But my church taught us, uh, the pastor taught us, that God cannot see sin in a believer's life. It's impossible to see it. And so the outcome of that was that believers started to think, I can go out and do just whatever I want because God can't actually see sin. I'm hidden in Jesus Christ. And then I came across this verse, and I've read this verse before, but this verse really one day hit me. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And I started to think to myself, well, if God doesn't see sin, how can I grieve the Holy Spirit when I sin? I used to think that sin did not hurt God, that God maybe might, might, have got, might get angry at what I do. But then he brought me to this passage. The Greek word for grieve is lupeo, which means to cause the stress, to be sad, to be heavy, to be heavy in heart. That's what this word is. God actually weeps when we choose to live in disobedience to him. We have, get this, we have a relational God. Our relationship is damaged not only with God, but also with fellow believers. This is what the point of that passage is. It is foolish for us to claim closeness to Jesus Christ while we are living in sin. If we say that we are in fellowship with God, but consistently gobble down porn, we are liars. A recent survey, I just saw this this week, found that roughly half of both men and women in America, adult men and women in America, believe that viewing porn is acceptable for adults. That should not be. If we say we enjoy intimacy with God, but constantly, verbally, abuse our spouse both in our speech and also in our actions we are we are liars we lie if we claim that we are close to god but repeatedly stir up trouble between others through gossip and complaining i'll give you the solution to all this in a few moments again i say walk in the light or you will stumble and tumble in darkness I'd like us to move on to a second lie that, that John now addresses. Lie number two is this, that we can reach a point of sinless perfection. There were some that thought you can be perfect, that you don't have to sin. John 1.8 says this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Here in this passage, John addresses the idea that Christians can get to the place where they no longer sin. Now, I don't know if you've ever met someone like that. I met a guy that way uh, back at my last church at Calvary Memorial. He came up to me, and he told me that uh, he doesn't sin, no longer sins. And I told him, yeah, you do. You just lied. You just lied, <laughs> which is a sin. He walked away. I, sh- I should have said this. Why don't you go home and ask your wife what she thinks about this? I think he changed his tune. God, you all know this. Sinless perfection is ours the moment that we step into heaven and not a moment before that. I, when I was in, I've shared this story before. It's unbelievable. What, when we went, a number of us went to Israel, we had a dinner uh, in a Bedouin tent, you know, a, a Muslim, that we rode camels and we had dinner, and he talked to us about the Muslim Islam religion and how he had gone to Mecca. 
And at the end of this, he said, now it's very important. He was around my age. He says, it's very important once you make your pilgrimage to Mecca that you never, ever sin again or Allah will not receive you into paradise. And I thought, why didn't you make that pilgrimage when you were about 90 years old instead of 60? Look again at verse 8. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I, I find it interesting here that John does not say the person who claims sinless perfection is lying. What he says is this person is deceiving themselves or fooling themselves. Everyone around that individual knows the truth. Now, as you grow in Jesus Christ, you should sin less, but you won't be sinless. Did you all get that? A sin in your life actually... The closer that you get to God, the sin in your life should bother you all that much more. And there must be, a, there should be a desire for you to deal with what is there. Amen. Let me give you one more lie, and we're going to get on to what we must do when we sin, which is in verse 9. What we're going to do right now is we're going to leapfrog over verse 9 and go to verse 10. And I think there's a reason why John does this. The third lie is this, I have never sinned. I have never sinned. Now, here, here's the verse. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I believe that verse 10 is actually directed at those who refuse to acknowledge they are sinners in need of a Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 6 says, we lie and we do not practice the truth. Verse 8 says, we deceive ourselves. The people in verse 10 are not God's people. They're making God out to be a liar. They oppose God. They're calling him a liar. Therefore, I believe they do not know God at all. And again, keep it in your mind that John is writing this, knowing that there are unbelievers, that there's even false teachers sitting in the church that are listening to these words. The Bible tells us that Everyone is born totally depraved, meaning we are totally lost in an enmity against God the moment that we breathe our first breath. And without God's help, we cannot produce a spark of genuine righteous behavior that is pleasing to God. I don't know whether you realize this or not, but people today hate being called sinners. You don't like to hear that word. Apart from the convicting work of the Spirit, they never will see themselves as sinners. Many today actually minimize and redefine sin, often alleging that their failures, not sins, but their failures of their lives and certain disorders exist because of how others have treated them. Many see themselves as victims. Wrong is not wrong. You must accept me for who I am. Exactly who I am. I have the right to determine who I am. So old man John, and I say that respectfully, old man John here states that those who think this way call God a liar. Did you know that in verse 10? So we have these three lies. We have the invitation. There's these three lies, though, that surround this invitation. So we now must ask ourselves, what do we do when we sin? And this brings me to the second sentence that I shared at the beginning of the sermon. And it's this, when you tumble, and you will, be humble, come clean, and confess your sins to God. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I think this verse actually has could have at least a double meaning or a double application, one for those who already know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and one for those who have never put their trust in Christ. Uh, what, what are believers, so let's first start with this, what are believers or followers of Christ to do when they sin? The answer is this, to come clean, ASAP, as soon as possible. What I mean is this, John is inviting us to admit to God and ask him for help. Take responsibility for what you did or what your thoughts are. Don't blame others. Own it. Name the sin. Actually, name it. And I would encourage you to name it what the Bible calls it. Rather than saying, I slept with someone, call it fornication or call it an affair. Call it sin. 
Chuck Swindoll states this, intimacy with God is rooted in honesty. I like that. If you're walking in the darkness of sin, the way back is to be, the way back, it starts by being honest with God. Now, you don't need to remember every sin. This is why I see in verse 9, verse 9 tells us that if we confess what we know, God will cleanse us from every sin, meaning the ones that you don't remember. I love this. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's what it says here. God is not picky. He's not the kind of God that says, well, listen, wait a second, you forgot one over here. And I'm going to let you sit until you figure out which one it is. We should ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and to reveal sin in our lives that is hurting us and that is hurting other people as well. But I believe that it is your heart that God is actually after. Now, with that said, let me give you a little warning. God's invitation to confess our sins shouldn't be treated like a bottle of sin sanitizer. Not skin sanitizer, but sin sanitizer that you simply squirt on your wicked deeds so that you can go out and do them again. Don't treat this like that. There should be somewhat of a desire for Christ to be back in right relationship. I thought of, when I, when I was looking at this, I thought of the image of, and every parent knows this, uh, you have a toddler. Now, toddlers sometimes, when they do wrong, they don't want to, they don't, they're angry, but when, when you correct them and they know they're wrong, most toddlers, young kids, what do they do at one time or another? They'll raise their arms and they'll say, please, Mommy. Let's be in right relationship again, and that's what confession is. God, I'm in darkness. I don't want to be there. I confess my sin of unbelief. That's actually what sin is. The core of all sin is unbelief. It's saying, God, you really don't know what you're talking about. This is where the light really is. But it says to confess, it means, God, I'm in darkness. I don't want to be there. I confess my sin of unbelief. Instead of obeying you, I did blank, and you name it. And when you do that, the scriptures tell us that all is good. He forgives, and all is good. You're back in a right, right relationship with each other. And if you're still struggling, God also tells us that we should confess our sins to one another so that we can be healed. We see this in the book of, of James. But, but don't do it this way. Here's a little humorous story, at least sort of humorous. story is told of how four preachers met for a friendly gathering. During the conversation, one preacher said, you know, we hear our people confess and pour out their hearts about certain sins and needs. Why don't, why don't the four of us do the same? And they talked about it a little longer and thought, well, confession is good for the soul. And so in, in due time, they all agreed. And so the first pastor confessed that he saw a movie that was was racy the second guy confessed to smoking cigars and and the third pastor confessed to playing the lottery and even gambling but he added that he had it all under control when it came to the fourth pastor he wouldn't confess he wouldn't say a thing the others pressed him saying come on now we shared our vices it's time for you to share yours so finally he answered My vice is gossiping, and I can't hardly wait to get out of here. (laughs) You need to find a safe community. (laughs) And even if someone does, does gossip about you, go ahead, confess to others. I'm not talking about that kind of confession where we're sharing. That's not community. Locking in the light requires open, honest participation in community with others in a local church body. Verse 7, we have fellowship with one another. That's what the apostle is driving at. and It's important to worship, but it's equally important for us to be in fellowship with other believers, more intimate community where we fight for and encourage each other to walk in our faith with Christ. This is why we have community groups. This is why we have life groups and our men and our women get together to study. I know of one man in our church, he, he has, every, I think it's every Saturday morning, they, a bunch of men gather in his garage around a potbelly stove in the winter so they can keep warm, and they call it Fight Club. 
And it's not Fight Club because they're all taking off their gloves and they're fighting, you know, punching each other. It's Fight Club in the sense that we are being real and honest with each other. We are spurring each other on to fight the good fight of faith that talk, Paul talks about in the scriptures. I said that one John could have an application too for those who aren't in God's family. I don't know where you stand spiritually before God today, but you, if you've never made a commitment for Jesus Christ, if you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ to save you from your sins, him alone as both Lord and Savior, you can make that right today. That same verse, 1-9, he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That happens as we, we accept Jesus Christ both as our Lord and Savior. Not that, we, that you have sinned, but that you are a sinner lost and in need of him to save you. And for all of us here this morning, I say this. Jesus wants him to walk with us to walk with him way more than we desire to do so. He stands. If you're walking in darkness right now, there is a, a sin pattern in your life. He stands ready to forgive. He says, come on over, be clean, don't walk over there. You're going to stumble, you're going you're to tumble, don't be there. Confess people and he will welcome you back with arms wide open. Intimacy with God is rooted though in honesty. Acknowledging the wrong is the first step toward a recovery of intimacy with God and also with fellow believers. And if your heart isn't there, confess that too. Without confession, your guilt is going to turn to shame, and eventually, it'll cause you to walk away from him and other people. My plea to you this morning is come clean. Is come clean. Now, now is not the time to walk in darkness. Now, especially at this time in our world's history, now is not the time to play around with sin. And I think you have all the time in the world. We will get to 1 John chapter 3, but in 1 John 3, John says this, everyone who thus hopes in Christ purifies himself as he is pure. I'll tell you this. I'd rather be in the middle of a cold, dark city any day than to have a cold, dark heart that is away from God. Deal with it. Turn from whatever it is. And if you need help, cry out to others, help me, I need to turn from this. This is not the time, as I said, don't play. Don't play. Join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for, once again, for your word. Without it, we would have nothing really to say. We just have the wisdom of men, and the wisdom of men is foolishness. But we thank you that you have given to us your word, and help us, God, to take it to heart and apply it to our lives. Help us to come clean and walk with you. And when we do stumble, Father, I pray that you will help us to quickly, very quickly, make things right with you by confessing whatever it is that we've done wrong. Thank you that your arms are open, that you want us to walk with you, that you give us the invitation, and that that invitation's on the table. It's out there for us each and every day. Thank you. We say this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Bob. Great message, hey? Before we get into the last song, I'm just kind of feeling led to just have us just do a quick chorus of this. The worship team doesn't know about this, so sorry. I just kind of feel led, though. Just sing with me. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. One more time. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of 
of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Amen. Please stand with us, hey? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, and to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more.
The kind of confession that we're talking about today or that I talked about is one that is done in the safety of a relationship. Uh, and what I mean by that is that Christ has you and he deals with us whenever we're in sin. He always deals with us while we're in the hug. We're all in this hug. Let me give you an illustration. If you're in a marriage relationship and you have a secure relationship, you know that when you do something that you can confess it and ask for forgiveness and the other is going to forgive you. Back a few weeks ago, I cannot remember for the life of me what it was, but I was crabby as all get out. And I said some nasty things, not the nicest things to Jean. I sort of took out, you ever take out your crabbiness on someone else? Okay, so I did it. And the Lord dealt with me that night. I got up the next morning and saw Jean, and I said, what I did was wrong. And will you forgive me? She looked at me, and she said, I do. We're okay. And that's the same kind of thing it is with us and with Jesus Christ. We do not have a God that's wagging the finger at us. We have a, a Savior that loves us, that is light. And he says, come, join me, walk with me. It is sweet with me, walk with me. And when you don't, come back over, confess it, so that we can walk together again. Amen? Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you.